Lebre i kadosh atalabra, reke de i kadosh ibra atalage de pratus. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to welcome you all to the Bible study of today. As you all know, it is a very good thing to always appear in the presence of the Lord. The Bible says they go from strength to strength, each and every one of them that appears before the Lord. Hallelujah. One of the things that the body of Christ needs to wake up to is to wake up into the reality that it is time to enter into a greater dimension of the ministry of the world without neglecting the need for revival. Revival is when God is in town through the Holy Ghost. And then the ministry of the world is what now empowers the people to begin to maximize their potential and fulfill destiny in a grand style. Hallelujah. The Bible says, Thou shall, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. By every word. The word of God is key to assess any dimension of empowerment. Hallelujah. This evening we are going to be looking at what I have titled The Keys of the Kingdom. The Keys of the Kingdom. Matthew 16 and verse 9, the Bible says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Most Christians, when they study this scripture, they think that binding and losing is the word itself, where you say, I bind, I lose. That is not what Jesus was referring to when he said, whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever we lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus did not say we should go and be saying the word, I bind, I lose, I bind, I lose. Because before he said that, he said, and I will give you the keys. And then with these keys, he says, you will be binding and losing as it already ordained in heaven. So we are going to be looking at what it means to bind and to lose. And we'll be looking at it in the eyes of the title of the message, The Keys of the Kingdom. The Keys of the Kingdom. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom that functions with keys or by keys. So when you don't have keys, you'll be stranded. You can't bind, you can't lose because you need keys of the kingdom to bind and to lose. One of the things that show that you don't have the keys is when what you are trying to bind or to lose is difficult. Difficulty is, a, is an indication or is a sign that you don't have the keys or you don't have the right keys. Hallelujah. Let me use this as an example. When you have the right key to a door, you know, every door is unique in the sense that every door has its own key. Some of you, you, you have many doors in your house, you will see that the key that opens one particular door is not the same key that opens the other door. Every door has its own unique key. When you don't have the key, the right key to any door, you will have to apply force. You will have to, you know, it, it, it will now be difficult for you to pass through that door because you will need to apply force. And in that process, you may need to damage the door. So it is important that we understand the keys that governs the kingdom of heaven so that with these keys we can bind and lose. We can determine our experiences on earth as children of God. Hallelujah. 
So he says, and I will give unto you the keys, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And then with these keys, he said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So what are these keys? Hallelujah. Follow me to the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Colossians 3 and verse 16. He said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Let's take it again. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Stop right there. Let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. It's talking about the keys. You must have abundance of keys so that no door will be shut at you except you want the door to remain shut and you shut it with the key. The keys of the kingdom is the words of the king of the kingdom. Oh, you didn't hear me. The keys of the kingdom of heaven are the words of the king that rules in heaven. And you know who that is? Jesus, of course. The Bible says he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. Jesus is the one sitting on the right-hand side of the throne of God. If you're a student of scriptures, you will understand that to sit on the right-hand side of the throne of God is to occupy the highest authority in the heavenlies. Hmm... That is where Jesus is seated. And the Bible says we are seated with him in that same right, right hand side of the throne of God. So in the realm of the spirit, we are sharing the same authority that Jesus is having as the king of kings and lord of lords. That is why he says he will give us the keys. His words. And with these keys, he said, we determine our experience in life. Hallelujah. What are the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24 to 27. Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24 to 27. He said, therefore, whosoever heareth the sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Verse 26. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of the house. Now, you will see in these words of Christ here, you will see that the problem is not who built and who didn't build. Both the wise and the foolish builded a house. The problem is on the foundation upon which the house we are builded. The foundation to build a house that when the flood, the, the wind, the forces of the world descend, and beat upon the house. He said it shall beat upon the house. He didn't say because the house is built on a rock that those forces will not beat upon it. He said they shall, build, they shall beat upon it, but it will not fall. It will not fall because it is founded on a rock. And he said the man who hears the words, the words which are the keys of the kingdom, the keys that governs the kingdom of heaven, 
He said, he that heareth it and did not apply, he didn't bind and lose with the keys. He said, he's like a foolish man that built his house on the sand. On the sand. And then the same experiences came and beat upon that house and they fell. And he said, great was the fall of the house because it is built on the sand. But the man who hears the words, the words of the king of the kingdom of heaven, which are the keys to bind and lose. He said, the man who hears these words and apply them and practice them and make them part of his life, part of his principle for living. He said, that man shall be likened unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock. <laughs> and he said, when the rains come and the winds blew and the flood came and beat upon that house, it will not fall. Because it is found on a rock. Hallelujah. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 4. He said, where the word of the where the word of a king is, there is power. You see that? There is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? When you apply the words of the king, there is no other power that will say to your words, What sayest thou? Or what doest thou? Meaning that the words of Jesus is the highest authority. The Bible says he is the head of the principalities and powers. He is the head. So anything you can call authority, anything you can call powers, anything you can call principality, Jesus is the head. That's why the Bible says, at the mention of his name, every knee bows. And every mouth confesses that he, Jesus, is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. The words of Jesus is the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So when you have the words of Christ dwelling in you richly, you have keys with you. The question is, are you applying them? Are you applying the keys, which is what enables you to bind and to lose? Because some of you, due to this ignorance, some things that are dominating you are things that you have the keys to bind. But because you don't know how to bind, things that you are to dominate are now dominating you. That is why I'm excited by the time we are done with this section, you will be armed. You will be armed to begin to apply the words of Christ that you have received. You know, he told them, he said, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, he didn't say if you have great faith as big as whatever. He said if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed. That means the words of Christ that you have had already. They are keys. They are keys you can use to bind whatever that is. That you don't want in your life. That has been my life. Whatever I don't want, I bind it. I bind it by not saying I bind. I bind it by saying words of the king that, has, that is at my disposal. I make a decree. I make a declaration based on the word of the king. You know, in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus came and he was asking Peter, did you catch any fish? They say, Master, we have toyed all night and we caught nothing. And Jesus said, cast your net upon the right side. And Peter said again, we have toyed all night, but we catch nothing. But at thy word, at thy word, we will lay down the net. And the Bible said the moment they did that, inspired by the words of the king of heaven, they caught multitude of fishes and their nets were breaking. That is abundance. That is abundance. Jesus did not preach to them. He didn't give them two hours, five hours, or all night sermon. He just gave them one word. Cast your nets on the right side. And Peter said, we have toyed all night. We caught nothing. But at thy word, at thy word, because you have said that I should cast on the right side, I will do it. And by the time he did it, you know what the result was. The Bible said they caught multitude of fishes and their nets were breaking. They have to now beckon to their partners on the other side of the river to come and partner with them for the great harvest they just encountered. 
Paul speaking, he said, let the words of Christ dwell in you richly. Why he said that is because you don't need to come to a point in your life where you will lack keys. Where you are confronted with situations. And you, that is where you will not be looking for the key to apply. No. You don't invent weapons in the war front. You invent your weapons at home and then you carry them to the war front. Those who try to invent weapons in the war front, they lose. Except God intervenes on their behalf. It is not wisdom to try to invent, to try to get keys while you are already in the midst of the battle. You must be armed at home. You must be rich in God's word. You must allow the words of Christ to dwell in you richly so that you will not come to any point in your life where you will lack words, where you will lack keys to bind and to lose. Am I speaking to somebody? Hallelujah. He said, where the word of a king is, he said, there is power, there is authority. He said, no one can challenge it. Jesus is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the one that is sitting at the right hand side of the throne of God in the heavenlies. His words is the highest authority. When you say what Jesus has inspired you to say, no authority can stand you. No authority can say no. When the Bible says at the mention of his name, you know, the name of Jesus is not just Jesus Christ. I hope you know that. The name of Jesus is revelation, is a revelation by his words. When Peter say, at thy word, that is the name of Jesus. At thy word, I will lay down the net. And by the time he did that, we know what the result was. The word of Jesus is the highest authority in the heavenlies. When you say what Jesus has said or what his words have inspired your own saying, you are in control. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, how do you receive the word that is key? How do you receive the word that is key? This is very, very important. Because if you don't know how to receive the word, you will not be rich in the words of Christ. Follow me to the book of John chapter 16 and verse 13 to 15. Sorry, John 16 from verse 13 to 15. He said, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. Mm. Last Sunday, I told you to master the arts of speaking words in the present tense. And it's amazing that when you study scriptures, you see God using present tense to speak to us from his logos, which is the written word. Rema is the revelation that comes from logos. Because Paul said the letter kill it, but the, 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 the spirit giveth life. The Bible is the logos of God's word. Right inside that logos, you have Rema which is the intent of the verse. Every communicator or everyone that communicates has an intention. The intention is captioned in the communication. That is why when Jesus, sometimes when he speaks, he will say, he that have ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. In his words, there is another word. That is why when speaking to them, you know, sometimes when I study scriptures, I, I ask some questions. Jesus, for example, we face crowd and speak to them. He speaks to people that have ears. They were not deaf. They were not blind. The miracles of healing the deaf and the, and, and the, and the dumb and you know, blind people. These, these, are, these are miracles. These are separate issues. But when he, when he teaches, he teaches to crowd. People that have ears, people that have eyes. They could hear him. They could see him. But he will leave them by saying, he that have ears, let him hear what the Spirit 
is saying to the churches. That means there is another ear that we must have to hear. That means there is another world inside what he has said. And it's only those that have ear, that ear that he's referring to, is only those that have that ear, they are the ones that can hear that other world that is inside the word he has said. So the logos of God's word carries rema. The rema is only for those who are able, who are able to, 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 to tap into the logos, to tap into the intent that the logos carry. Hallelujah. Back to John 16, 13 to 15. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, is come. <laughs> he didn't say shall come. Is come. He said he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Ghost will never speak to you about himself. The Holy Ghost has a ministry. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, as we are about to, 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 to read, is to reveal the words of Christ to the church. To those that have ear, that ear that Jesus refers to, where he said, them that have ear, let them hear. He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, Hear from who? Jesus. That shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. That is vision. Vision of what is about to happen and all that. Now look at, look at verse 14. He said, He shall glorify me. How? For he shall receive of mine and shall show them unto you. Verse 15, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I say, therefore I said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show them unto you. The Holy Spirit is the one that delivers to us the rhema of the words of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the power of God. This coming Sunday, that is on the 12th, 12th March, that is in the next couple of days, the Lord has led me to conduct a teaching on the spirit of the blessing. And I would like you to be part of it. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be empowering. It's going to be life transforming. Hallelujah. There you'll be seeing how the Holy Ghost is our only access. Our only access to any dimension in God. Here we are saying that the Holy Spirit is the one that takes from Jesus and gives to us. He receives from Jesus and he shows it to us. He reveals it to us. He lets us know the meaning of what Jesus has said. He says, he shall receive of mine and he shall make them known unto you. That is the key. The key is what the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost reveals to you. The key is not Logos. Uh, the key is not logos the key is rema don't get me wrong if the logos which you can you know based on your your study of scriptures you have become loaded with scriptures you know verses you know scriptures but when you speak those words of scriptures inspired by rema you are in command you are in command. Now, you remember in, Ma in Matthew chapter 4, is also in Luke chapter 4, the account of our Lord Jesus when he went to 40 days uh, fasting and the devil came 
tempting him, he said, it is written. It is written. Everything Jesus has told us to do, he himself did it. Sometimes when you study scriptures from the Old Testament and you come to the New Testament, it will look as if there are contradictions. No. If you study with materials, you will see that there is no contradiction anywhere in scriptures. Though we can sense limitations of men, but the Holy Spirit will give you the accuracy of the revelation of that scripture so that you will have the right key to bind and to lose. Hallelujah. The other time I said, you have to study. Don't just read. When you read, what you obtain is information. Information that most of the time is available to everybody. But when you study, you tap revelation. Revelation is something that is not available to everybody. Only those who can study. Paul speaking to Timothy didn't say go and read and show yourself approved unto God. He says study. There's a difference between reading and studying. I read and I study. When you read, you can just hold one book in your hand and in the next few hours you are done. But when you study, you gather materials. You gather materials. You gather materials to, to, to cross-check, to research. So that you will understand by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you will understand what the word is actually communicating. That becomes the key handed to you by the Holy Spirit to bind and to lose. Hallelujah. He said, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he shall guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show them unto you. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He guides us into all truth. You know, there are truths. There are truths. Some truths are too heavy. To understand but with the help of the Holy Spirit you, you, you tap into the revelation of that truth and that becomes your key that becomes your key to bind and to lose hallelujah Isaiah 55 from verse 10 to 11 New International Version Isaiah chapter 55 from verse 10 to 11 he says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Verse 11. So is my word. <laughs> this word here is not talking about the logos. He's talking about Rema. The revelation behind God's word, the intent, the will, the will. In 1 John, it says, if we ask anything according to his will, the will is revealed in his word. The word of God carries God's intent, God's will for the hour, for the, for the season for the period, for the dispensation. That is why we must be studious. We must always seek God. I said that last Sunday. We must always seek God to know what is his will for the time, for the hour, for the season, for the dispensation. Because the will of God that gave you victory last year might not be the same rema that will grant you the victory you desire this year. That is why you must always be seeking God. You must always be seeking God to know what God's will is for the time. And let me say it again. I always say this. Don't be too spiritual to the extent that you neglect your intellectual life is a risk. 
I'll be sharing more lights on this in our Sunday service just a few days from now. Don't be too spiritual to the extent that you neglect the development and the transformation of your mind. It's a risk. People who are too spiritual without a transformed mind, they always misinterpret God's will and purpose for the time. So they lead people to error. Hmm. They lead people to error. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, Paul said, Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you will prove what is that good, perfect. What is that good, acceptable and perfect will of God? You see, he talks about you being transformed in your mind to be able to accurately interpret the revelation of God's word. Not just to teach people to go and apply and succeed to your own life. So if you yourself be spiritual, but without a transformed mind, not just a transformed mind, a mind that continues to be transformed, so that the accuracy of the trans interpretation of God's word will also be continuous, then you, you are a great leader who is worthy of followership. That is my life. That is my life. I always study. I always want to know what is God's will for the next move. What is God's intent? You have to master these acts. That is why I engage in various studies. In various ways of transforming my mind. So that I will accurately and at all times interpret God's will and purpose for the time. This is one of the keys. The major keys that guarantee success for any believer. The ability to accurately interpret God's will by his word. Hallelujah. It says, so, verse 11 of Isaiah 55. So is my word that goeth out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Every revelation of God's word is for a purpose. And God say his word must not return to him empty. It must accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. You know, he sent his word and he healed them and delivered them from all their diseases. He sent his word. What they needed as at that time was his word for healing. And he sent his word and they received it and they were healed and delivered. You must always desire to, to tap into the revelation of God's word for the hour. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It's so vital. It's so crucial. When Paul said that, he said, I beg you. He said, I beseech you, brethren. He was begging them to engage in the transformation of their minds. For their own good. So that they can accurately interpret God's will and purpose from the word of God. The word of God is available to every Christian. But the revelation of God's word, many are too lazy to engage in the practice that will enable them and empower them to accurately interpret God's word. When Paul told Timothy to study, to show himself approved unto God, he says so that he will be a workman who needed not to be ashamed, rightly interpreting 
the word of God. The word divide means interpreting the word of God. You reign, you ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. Hallelujah. Now let's look at the book of Matthew chapter 10 from verse 19 to 20 as we begin to round up. Matthew chapter 10 from verse 19 to 20. Before we read, you will need to catch this. You will need to catch this. It's so vital. It's so important. The transformation of your mind. Much emphasis cannot be placed on this subject. You study the writings of Paul. He always hit on this point. Say, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Be renewed in the... He said, be, be transformed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He was always hitting this point because he, he, he was trying to make us understand how vital it is. How crucial it is for our mind to always be transformed so that we can accurately interpret the will and purpose of God for the hour. Have you not noticed that each time you come to scripture, the same verse you read last year, you came to it again this year, and the revelation you got is different from the one you got last year. He said, once he has spoken, but twice I have heard. Once he has spoken, but twice I have heard. That power, all power belongs to God. That is a function of your mind. Once he spoke, but twice you must hear it. So you must not get to any point in your life where you begin to, to get too familiar with the word of God. Because the same revelation, the same scripture that gave you the keys you used in binding the enemy last year and you succeeded in your, in, in, in your life might also be the same scripture that we grant you the same another key another revelation different from the one of last year the question is are your mind transformed enough since that last year are your mind transformed enough to grasp the fresh revelation that is coming from the same scripture you know one of the problem we are too familiar with scriptures. That is why I told you that sometimes you see somebody that studies scriptures a lot. He knows, he knows almost, you know, all the scriptures he has read, they are in his head. Before you want to quote, he already knows what, what is the end. He knows it. But that is not the rema. That is logos. You must understand the intent of that logos. You must understand God's will. The will of God that he's trying to communicate to you from that same scripture. You must, you must grasp it. You must tap it. You must understand it. That is your key. That is the word that rules in heaven. That is the word of the king. He said, the Holy Ghost shall receive that word from the king and make it known unto you through the words that he has already said when he was physically on earth. Hallelujah. Never get tired of transforming your mind. It's a lifelong, it's a, it's a lifelong exercise. It's something we do as long as, we, as, long as Jesus tarries. It's something we do the transformation of our minds. Because spirituality cannot function beyond your intellectual capacity. 
your spirituality on any dimension cannot function beyond your intellectual capacity. Your intellectual capacity is what determines the extent to which the, the, your spirituality functions. Hallelujah. Too much of spirituality without a transformed mind is a risk. That is what we call religion. <laughs> Spirituality without any regard for intellectuality. That is what we call religion. That is what has invaded our continent. But our generation is putting an end to it. We must be transformed people. We must be people that is understanding. Paul said, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy in business but understanding the will of God. Don't be lazy, but understanding the will of God. The ability to understand is the, is, is the power of your mind. Hallelujah. Now let's look at Matthew 10 from verse 19 to 20. But when they deliver you up, Take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. Verse 20. For it is not you that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. You see that? The Holy Spirit received from Jesus and delivers it to us by speaking inside us. The Holy Ghost speaks to your mind. <laughs> now you, can, you are beginning to understand me now. The Holy Ghost speaks to your mind. Your spirit and Holy Spirit is one. See, him that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So you and the Holy Ghost have become one. So how do you understand the key that is required to bind or to lose? It's through your mind. That understanding is through your mind. The Holy Ghost speaks to your mind. So if your mind is not transformed, it is either you will misinterpret what the Holy Ghost is speaking to you, or you will not even understand that the Holy Ghost is the one speaking at all. You see why it is a risk to be spiritual and not be intellectual. Let me tell you this. Somebody who is highly intellectual but very little spiritual can rule over somebody that is highly spiritual but little intellectual. <laughs> oh, you didn't hear what I said. Let me repeat this. Somebody who is very, very great in intellectuality, in the transformation of his or her mind, we rule over somebody that is great in the, in the spirit, but little in the mind. In leadership, there is a saying that says, I think it was Alexander the Great who said that. He said he is not afraid of a battalion of lions that are led by a sheep. Hmm. Is Kalatosh Kabaata. He said he's not afraid. You know, he was a, he was a warlord. Alexander was, he, he was always fighting war. Most of his victory came through war. He said he's not afraid to see a battalion of sheep led by a lion. I mean, a battalion of lions led by a sheep that he's not afraid of them. But he said he's afraid to see a battalion of sheep led by a lion. <laughs> a battalion of sheep led by a lion, Alexander says he's afraid of them. But he's not afraid of a battalion of lions that is led by a sheep. So no matter how spiritual you can claim to be, 
if you are low in the matters of intellectuality, you are already lacking behind, no matter your level of spirituality. Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you, brethren, that you engage in the transformation of your mind so that you will be transformed. Transformation is a function of the renewal of your mind. The renewal of your mind. It's a being transformed consistently by the renewing of your mind. As you continue to renew your mind, as you continue to empower your mind, you continue to experience transformation. Hallelujah. He said, it is not you that speaks. It is the spirit of your father that speaketh in you. The Holy Ghost speaks to your mind. So you must, you must be someone who can understand the voice of the Holy Spirit and interpret what the Holy Spirit is communicating to you through your mind. You are mighty on your throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You bind, you lose by understanding the will of God from his word communicated to you by the Holy Spirit. That is, how, that is how we prevail. That is how we obtain victories. By binding things we don't need in our life. Losing things that are bound but we need in our life. By the keys, the words of the king of heaven. You see, wherever the word of a king is, there is power, there is an authority. And he said, no one can say, hey, what doest thou? You can't challenge the authority of Christ. So when the Holy Ghost receives from Jesus and hand it over to you and you understand it 100%, you are in command. You are in command. No authority can question or disagree when you apply the key. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You are mighty on your throne. Now receive grace in the name of Jesus to accurately interpret the words of Jesus communicated to you by the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare every barrier, everything stopping you from renewing your mind so that you can accurately interpret the revelation of God's word. I command them broken in the name of Jesus. Be free in the name of Jesus. From today, I decree and I declare, you will always, at all times, interpret God's word by the revelation of the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus Christ. The keys that you need to always bind and to lose. Whenever they are communicated to you by the Holy Ghost, I declare you will receive them without hindrance in the name of Jesus Christ. You are blessed spirit. You are blessed soul. You are blessed in your body in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you next Sunday as we dive into the wonderful life-changing subjects titled The Spirit of the Blessing. God be with you. See you on Sunday.